Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Are you a brew head? I'm a brew head. Y'all a brew heads? Yeah, we brew heads. So pour a glass of crap beer. We can do this. Yeah. What's good, y'all? This is C Certified Brewhead, and welcome to episode 111 of Beer Not the Podcast Adjunct Series. This evening, we have a banger. This is a brewery uh, that uh, the gentleman joining me on the podcast had put me onto God, maybe years ago. I couldn't even tell you when. I'm very excited to hear the full story. But before we get into it, we have a sponsor this week. If you guys were around last year, you will remember that we had manscaped as our sponsor the uh her most hilarious ad reads of all time i don't even have to add anything much to it i just read this and it's good so i'm gonna get into it uh it's never too early to play holiday music and it's never too early to start thinking about gifts whether it's for a friend or the friends in your pants you can make this season to be jolly with manscaped do your little drummer boy a favor and use the lawnmower 4.0 where is she boom uh, to avoid another silent night in the bedroom. Then add Manscaped's top-of-the-line shower products. Boom. To have people thinking, all I want for Christmas is you. Shouts to Mariah. Santa cares about his sack and so should you. Fucking hell. Look nice when you get naughty by going to Manscaped and use the code BAOS for free shipping and 20% off. Mate, get that. So I've been using it since last Christmas. And uh, it's a beaut. The old uh, the weed whacker for the nose. This bad boy, which is the 4.0, and the two little um, crop preservers and crop revivers. I don't know. This shit is just hilarious. I love it, man. It makes you feel great. It's easy. Um, the Manscaped Platinum Package 4.0, which is this here, is a one-stop shop for the man who deserves it all. It's everything needed to help you deck the holes from face to balls just in time for mistletoe season. Who writes this? The Platinum Package has each product from the best-selling performance package, plus Ultra Premium Body Wash, which is these two things I was holding up here. Uh, two-in-one shampoo conditioner and um the deodorant which is that little bad boy right there um it's the best way to smell fresh from your santa hat to your candy cane the lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer and the weed whacker nose and here nose and ear hair trimmer feature proprietary advanced skin safe technology to protect your protect your delicate presence plus both are waterproof so there's no issue clearing out the snow from your driveway there's a 4000 k led light on it so you can light the way like rudolph now that you've groomed your candy cane it's time to make sure you don't smell like a reindeer with the platinum package shower products all the manscaped shower gear are sulfate free vegan and made to have your skin feeling hydrated and smelling fresh so this is a crop exfoliator and crop gel and a shaver thing too which is lit um, oh, maybe they were the shower products. My bad. And you got this little like body buffer thing to like scrub that on, mate. Bloody ripper. Uh, but smelling good doesn't stop the shower. The crop preserver bowl deodorant and crop reviver bowl toner solve stank problems all day long. Once they touch the sack, you'll never go back. The Platinum Package 4.0 sitting under the tree is guaranteed to put anyone in the holiday spirit. And for the perfect stocking stuffer, add in the brand new body buffer, which is him, an incredible body scrubber that makes exfoliating easy and a lot cleaner than the old loofah. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code BAOS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with the code BAOS. Manscaped, get your jingle balls ready for the holidays and with that nice little piece of entertainment at the beginning we're going to bring in the esteemed guest on the podcast this evening we have gavin from anderson and nathan from nathan does Real in the building gentlemen pleasure how y'all doing good to see you boys likewise gavin how are you doing yeah thanks for having me Pleasure, man. Thank you for uh, bearing with well. me. Well, yeah, nice uh, Friday night. Right, hanging out. We had a bit of tech difficulties to begin with, but we're in business. Our uh, we got our plans to keep fresh right here, and uh, now we're going to crack open some beers. So I really look forward to this, man. I'm, uh, Nate put me onto you guys. Do you remember when it was, Nate? It must have been. Uh, it, it, it must have it, like it must have been like five years ago, so like something thinking. like that. It's been a little while, <laughs> and it's uh, you know. I feel like you always got me your faves. You always had a bunch of favorites and you like made sure that you're, oh man, you need to try this. So I've really been excited to get the story direct from you, Gavin. Uh, tonight we're going to be starting, uh, we're going to drink a, a bunch of beers and we're going to be starting with the cream ale. Where is it? There he is. Boom. Look at that. Let's go. Um, tell us about this beer, dude. 
Sure. So the cream ale is uh, it's one that's almost one of our original beers. I think when we've opened uh, at the start, we had um, let's just there we go, crack that bad boy open. Yeah, get him. Uh, we had our flagship pie PA, which we have two tonight, but um, started with a wheat beer, and people just got like I don't know, it was way too confusing because there's like American wheats, Belgian wheats, German wheats. So everyone who came in is like, I don't like wheat beers. It's too much like banana. It's like, well, it's it's an American wheat beer, but sure. that's fine. So we decided <laughs> to switch it up, and we brewed the cream ale like a month or two after we opened, and we've just been we've just been stuck with that one ever since. Love it. So I love it. I mean, it's it's a crusher. It's probably it's probably one of our most popular ones. Um, I think we've won uh, three or four national awards for it. A couple of provincial ones and one international one. So oh wow, uh, it's uh it's our most acclaimed beer, but um, it's also that's, just a real crusher. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Like, uh, I, I feel like when a beer like this wins those type of awards, I feel like it almost like, I don't know, it seems like a harder style to brew when it's, you know, maybe that, does that mean more to you that, that, that yeah. a style like this that wins those awards? I think, yeah, they're a little tricky because um, like there's not too much to them. So like yeah. if you, I mean, you can brew a, kind of shoddy beer and just dry hop the heck out of it. No one will notice, but if it's uh, like a lagered yeah. ale, it's, it's pretty obvious if you do anything wrong. <laughs> That's a really, really good point. Um, boys, get it in you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Glorious. Cream ales are unique beer, and I feel like um, – maybe the knowledge isn't really there. I always forget what is different about them. Could you just maybe go into exactly what makes a cream ale, what it is? Sure. Yeah. And, and it seems like these days it's a pretty poorly defined style. Cause I right. think it was uh, very popular pre prohibition. And then a lot of the, the breweries that made it got shut down and never really came back. Mm. So this recipe we actually based off of uh, like a, a, old scrap of a cream ale recipe that we found in like a historical brewing book. Uh, so it is as That's traditional cool. as it possibly can be, I think, but it's, it's another one that people always say like, Oh, it's not some people to say, I don't want it. It's too creamy or they think there's milk in it or something like that, but it, it's really not supposed to be creamy. It, it was the, like the American ale brewers answer to German lagers that were all coming over in like the 18, 1900s. Right. So it's just it's just supposed to be like it's a lager ale. It's just supposed to be nice and crisp and and crushable. That's what we're going for. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's I think in this up. case the cream, the cream uh, is the same origin as like cream soda, where it's not creamy. I think it was just right. like old timey slang where cream meant like like, like really good. So and, it's a cream um, ale. It's like a cream of the crop kind of. It's not like a yeah. It's not made of milk. Yeah. I, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer as a style name for sure, um, and yeah. I, I also feel I also feel like there's not um, like there are not a ton of uh, breweries in Ontario making a cream ale. Certainly not uh, like not many that have as part of their core lineup. Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, how many years have you guys like have you guys been operating now? Uh, we just passed our six year anniversary in August. Six year, okay, yeah, um, yeah, that's cool. Because, uh, like, because what I was thinking is that, like, your core lineup is, um, it like is really interesting because it's like it's a lineup that I feel like if you had opened maybe uh, like maybe even two years later than you had, um, you'd have a hard time. Um, like kind of selling people with that, like with a core lineup that like that that has a cream ale. It's good. Like I feel like you came in at the right time um, to have a core lineup that has a cream ale and an amber and whatnot. It's uh, it's it's a tough market to uh, like to be able to have um, those kind of styles. So it's uh, like I feel like it's good that you guys were able to um, kind of build your your brand with having some really like straightforward, clean styles in your core lineup. Would you? Um, would you, like, would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, when we uh, opened six years ago, I think there was like uh, Muskoka has a cream ale. I think Cameron's had a cream ale and Sleem and cream ale, obviously, mm. but there weren't many. Mm. Uh, and now, like a couple of years later, I think there's like three or four permanent cream ales just in London. So it's a style that is maybe is catching on more now. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, it was also a little tricky to get people um, onto it because people who'd come in never had a craft beer before. And they're like, what? Give me a lager. It's like, well, we have cream ale. Like, I don't want that. It's too creamy. It's like, <laughs> just, just try a little bit. So it, it's, but it's growing on people. I think the more that people like kind of become aware of it, the more popular it's becoming. Interesting. That's fascinating that maybe there's more popping up in London. I mean, I wonder if that means it's a region. I haven't noticed anywhere else, but I wonder if that's regional or if it's just, you know, cream owls are coming back a bit. That's interesting. I guess it could go either way, right? Um, mm, yeah, I don't know. I hope they're coming back because I like them. Yeah. The yeah. difference between, I mean, you call it a, it's a lagged <laughs> ale. What is the difference between a cream owl and a kolsch? Like, is it the malt? Is it the um, the yeast? Is there something specific? It's uh, kind of the grain bill is the main difference, and the yeast, I think, are the, the main two. Like, a uh, Kolsch is usually brewed with the German Pilsner malt or, uh, it's like, some more lighter, uh, easier-going malts. And, um, like, the, the yeast is pretty specific, too, because a lot of the flavor from a Kolsch is that really delicate, like, pear, stone fruit, like the really light, fruity esters and a really crisp, clean body where the cream mill has got a little more substance. So right. this one, we'd use a bit of um, caramel malt and we use uh, some traditional like six row barley and a lot of corn too, right? If you think about it, it's a tr really traditional style and people brew with what they had and, and American brewers had a lot of corn. So <laughs> I think a lot of the, the flavor, the malt base in this one comes from the corn. I, I get a really nice sweetness and complexity from it. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. I have a friend uh, in the beer industry in Alberta and she always like, it's like her thing to like shit on cream ales and I've always liked them. So I've never seen anyone like not like them. And she always says something about a vegetal taste in it, but I'm not getting that here at all. Like, is that ever like, is that a real thing that multiple people, or maybe it's just her particular palate that doesn't align. No, yeah, I think that's that's not uncommon. Like one of the the main defects you get in beer is DMS, which is like that if you don't boil it properly, you get that like cooked cabbage, canned corn kind of aroma, which is right. really off putting. And so I think because this one has so much corn in it that like if you smell it, you can smell the the aroma from the corn. I don't think it tastes like cream corn or cooked corn, but uh, for some people, it's I think it's too close that like corn to the canned corn and maybe they pick up on what they perceive as a bit of DMS or something like that. But, um, it's supposed to be corny. Gotcha. Good corn. Good corn. Okay. That makes sense. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask about right that because I always saw that and I was always like, I wonder, cause you know, sometimes some people have specific palates that pick up strange flavors that are very unique to their tongue and what's going on there. So I wasn't sure if that was a, a known thing about cream out. So we're learning tonight, folks. It's awesome. Um, yeah, man, it's a great beer, and I'm I'm happy to know that there's a demand for for cream ales out there uh, again. So it'd be interesting to see what happens now that with this conversation. Um, have you noticed, Nate, any like an influx of cream ales at all in the last little bit? Um, I haven't really. Um, it's like it's one of those styles that when they like when you do see them come up, I think it's uh, you, you know you, you don't really see a whole lot of one-off cream ales. Like I can mm. think of uh, like I can think of a couple others, like including the ones that Gavin mentioned um, that have cream ales as part of the like as part of their core lineup. Um, but generally, from breweries that have been on the scene for a while. Um, I'm like if I think of any breweries that have opened in the last uh, like in the last two or three years, I don't think I can think of a single one that's been uh, like that's put out a cream ale. Mm, yeah, now they can I that uh, it's going to be interesting. Now keep an eye out for it. So this is uh, this is dope, man. So let's get into the beer history. I always love this. I want to hear how did you, Gavin, get into craft beer and how did that you know pave the way to brewery to to the brewery opening. 
Sure, I think it's a. I guess we got some time. It's kind of a long story, but let's go. <laughs> I'll, we, I'll got beers, we got time. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it started for me in uh, college. I guess um, just getting into trying new beers and stuff like that, and went to the LCBO. Back then, it was just like your big brands, and I think pretty much the only specialty stuff they had there was uh, like Belgian things. So you get some Orval or uh, Rochefort or. Um, uh, like left blonde things like that and so i would get like i i mean i'd only had keith's and canadian and blue up to that point so i had a couple of those and it like like blew my mind the amount of flavor and like complexity in those beers so that's what i really got interested in it and then um i think the next year a couple of years later for christmas my dad got me a like a starter homebrew kit just like a nice. like a 20 liter plastic bucket and like a construction book and things like that and so i started dabbling in that made my first batch like you put in the extract put in your water put in your yeast stir it around just wait a couple of weeks good to um go. it was pretty good like it wasn't <clears throat> bad so i i went and like bought some more <clears throat> stuff made my second batch tweaked it a little bit uh and a couple of weeks later bottled that one tried it and it was like it was absolutely terrible it was the worst <laughs> thing i've ever had in my life so I think that's the point. That's like the make or break point for a lot of home brewers where you either like give up or try and figure out how to make your junk beer as cheap as possible, or you like really dive into it and try and figure out like how to make this decent. And, and luckily that's the way that I went. So I, I started researching uh, like other how to brew books and, and um, really got involved in different recipes and really ramped up my home brewing and stuff. And it helped that at the same time I was, um, a student uh, studying microbiology. So there's a lot of overlap between the two, I think. Hmm. And um, yeah, they, uh, home brews, entered a bunch of competitions, was winning awards from. As soon as I graduated, I got hired to work as a brewer in a brewery in New Brunswick. And same thing, it was going really well there. Um, our brewery won a bunch of awards. Finally, after a couple of years, convinced my family to kind of back this project and move back to London and and, uh, the rest is history. That's awesome, man. And that nice. was when did the brewery, um, like when you went to move back to London to start your own thing? When was that? So that we kind of, we kind of um, I think we started construction in like May of 2016, and we opened our doors August 6 in 2016. So wow. it's pretty frantic couple months getting the place yeah. built and ready and. Uh, yeah, we just passed six years operation. That's amazing, man. Three months is pretty nice. – uh, that's pretty good. From the stories I hear, I have some pretty horror stories of how long it took people to – from you know acquiring the facility to getting getting everything done. Like three months is like insane. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty frantic. <laughs> I can imagine. Was it? Would you prefer it that way? Would you do it any other way or it's like just go for it? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's so stressful those first few months, right? Because you're you just all your money's going out the window. You're just paying bills and nothing's coming in. So yeah. if we stretch it out much longer, I don't know how much we how much longer we could have done it for. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um. So then, okay. So you you know you're already successful in the brewing world, and you want to sort of run your own shop, which obviously is tends to be the dream for for most folks. What was your intention? So call it like starting Anderson. Anderson is is that your last name? I don't think it is though, right? Yeah. It is. Yep, okay. Yep, apologies. Yep. Um why what, no, what was the intention? What were you well like, all right, my brewery is gonna be this kind of brewery, it's gonna make this stuff. Like what was the sort of like the map for what you guys were gonna do? Uh I mean I think that our kind of main idea is just to brew stuff that we like to drink and i feel like i'm a pretty normal person so hopefully a lot of people also like to drink it so <laughs> i mean that's kind of been our goal the whole time is just brew like true to style beers the best quality that we possibly can and uh hope people like it okay straightforward the <laughs> like sometimes you know some people go i'm you know this belgian themed breweries or some people are following the hype stuff whatever it might be so i feel like you guys kind of do a bit of everything and i guess that fits in with the ethos of what you were just describing there um is there any like would you say that there's like a there's not a specific approach then like it's just more like 
there's really good beers in basically any style that interests you and the team. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, we, uh, we, we had one, um, a one year old and my wife wanted to move back to Ontario and no one would hire me. So it's like, Oh, let's just open our own brewery and just do our own thing. And so, but yeah, it was good. Cause we have the, uh, myself and four other people on the brewing team now and pretty much every beer we just take turns going through like someone takes a turn what do you want to brew this week and we make it and if there's something someone comes up with an idea that uh we don't think we could pull off then we just do that in a small batch maybe and see if it works but uh yeah i mean that that's really the goal is just we brew stuff that we like to drink and we make we make it as good as we can <laughs> hey, Matt, i love that nice he, what did you open with <laughs> sorry nate that was my last question. No, 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 that, no, that's okay. That's a good, that, that's a good question. Sorry. What was the question? What did we open with? Yeah. Like which, which were the, um, the beers that you kicked everything off with? So our original lineup and we still have all of them except for the wheat, which I mentioned at the start, we had our, like our classic IPA and we had a wheat beer and we had our Amber and we have our Brown. So okay. those four, we still make uh year round but the wheat was abandoned and we, we came up with the cream ale recipe and that one took its place as a permanent. So that's five, five cores. Okay. I love that. That's great. That well, the still wheat's gone. The that's wheat's just gone. IPA, but it email, amber brown. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Right. So four. Nate, sorry. I cut you off before. Yeah, no, 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 that's all right. And, and like, that's a really, like, that's a really good core lineup. Um, and, I feel like that's one of those one like that that's the kind of lineup that ha, that like that has something for for almost any uh, that like for almost any taste. Yeah. Um and, and I'm sure that must have been the case at the time. And I'm thinking back because the uh, like the only time I've uh, like I've had the uh, good fortune to visit the brewery was back like was in uh, 2017. So I guess you guys must have uh, been open for a year at the time. Um and I'm thinking back at the time. I think you had the core lineup, and maybe one, like, and maybe one or two others, um, on, like on at the time. Like you probably, like you probably had Spring um, on, and uh, it, like, and maybe one other. But uh, like, but what struck me is that, um, like, that, uh, and then when I got, a, like, I got a bunch more a couple, uh, like, a couple years ago, and like noticing how much your lineup had really exploded, um, in the, like, in that time, like, quite a bit, like, quite a larger lineup, um, like, that you'd had, um, over the years. I'm assuming that must have come just with, uh, like, just with larger capacity in the, uh, like, in the ability to be able to kind of put, uh, um, put more styles out as the, like, as the brewery grew. Is that, uh, is that how that went? Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, I look back at uh, old photos when we opened and like our tap room, we just have this like really nice 20 foot uh, like live edge oak bar. And then behind the bar, there's like a teeny little stainless plate with like six taps in it and the whole wall is like totally blank. So when we opened, that's all we could really do is just I mean, we had six beers for a while and then uh, we got a few. Like we were doing half half the time, we were just brewing IP and cream ale, so we didn't have a lot of time for variety. And then uh, we hired another brewer, got a big tank, just fill that up with cream ale, and then we could use the smaller tanks to start doing some more new and interesting stuff. So we had uh, like I think a, our Martin autumn was our first seasonal, and we came out with a stout in the winter, and then the spring in the, the first spring, and then I think after that we had enough capacity that we could start. Like we, we always try to do one to two new beers every month in addition to like the seasonal rotating ones. And now we can't, like now we have enough people and capacity and, and stuff that we can keep cranking out new ones and try new stuff. But yeah, at the start we were definitely limited by like how much we could do with just myself and Pete, who's other brewer who's still around. But like I was doing brewing and then kind of if someone came in the tap room, we would just like put a pin in it and run up and like see what they wanted and then like run back to the brew system. And so it was, <laughs> we could just kind of do whatever we could do back then. But now, yeah, now we're able to sustain the core stuff and still do some fun stuff at the same time. Hmm. Well, that's that's cool. cool. Yeah, man. What was the first, like, I know that there's the, uh, the seasonal series where you actually have beers 
named after each season, which I thought was cool. And they wrote, they changed. Like, they're not, like, the same big year on year. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, that's accurate. It's, um, and it's kind of the same thing if we, uh, like, we just brew what we want to make. If uh, we, next year, we don't feel like doing the same one, then we'll switch it up, which mm. is, I mean, admittedly very confusing for customers. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to get away from that a little bit. But uh, yeah, we've like our original summer was a session IPA that was like 3%. And then we really like, we're just craving Pilsners. So we flipped that one over to a Pilsner. And then our spring was a uh, Schwartz beer. And then Ooh, nice. now currently it's like a, like a, India pale lager, kind of like a dry hop pale ale with all New Zealand hops. And our winter, we flipped to from like a spiced amber ale to like a stronger Belgian double. Um, but yeah, now because I mean, it is super confusing to have a beer called summer three years in a row and it's three different things that uh, we're, we're, we're kind of getting away from that now and going back to the rest of our, our kind of branding lineup where the can just says what's in it. It's a lot easier for people to understand. Gotcha. That makes sense. I gotta say, I, I, I gotta say though, I liked that switch from the, like from the session IPA to the, uh, to the German pills. Yeah. Um, no, like no knocking the session IPA. I just, like, I, it's just not a style that I, the, that I tend to prefer. I remember what, like, when I was there in 2017 summer was the session IPA and, uh, um, it like, and it must've been, uh, like a couple of years afterwards that I had it when it was switched to the German pills and that it like that is a damn good pills like that's a, a, a like it's super super crisp really like really refreshing like that's what you want on a, a, a like on a hot summer day like that one is aptly named I, I like I was in favor of that, that change <laughs> oh thanks yeah the Pilsner is my favorite for sure like I'm a hundred percent a Pilsner guy I think we're I, I'm, I'm we're right on the cusp of of like making that one a full, like full year round, but Ooh. you can't make every beer. You like a core beer. We'd have like 36 core beers. So I think <laughs> it's, it's probably going to remain as a summer seasonal for now. That's fair. I mean, you could always like make it the year, like summer 2022 or whatever. So then it's like every year it's a, you know, you know, it's that year and it could change that kind of gives you that. But I also understand that maybe, not everyone gets that, you know, the, the year yeah. thing is typically for barrel age stuff or whatever. So it might just be oh, yeah. a lot for consumers to kind of deal with. Yeah. That's a co collector's item. If it's vintage dated cans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the only way around it. I was just thinking while you were explaining it, I was like, yeah, that's one way. Cause you know, Oh yeah. Well, it's the 2022 version. It could be anything like then you could just sort of do whatever, but yeah, <laughs> I also respect, uh, I respect that, um, that change. One of the things I also noticed, and I know we'll, we'll get into like the IPA and stuff soon. So you said the IPA is like a sort of classic American or like West coast IPA. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I swear, yes, that's right. Nate, you got me some beers from uh, Anderson. I think I, I have a, a memory of a beer that had laurel hops in it and it was straight haze, like just juice bomb. So I feel like, is that accurate? Yeah. That would have been one of the single hop ones. Yeah. Uh, we... but like, like from a couple of years ago. Yeah. That was that was killer. I love that. I guess my, my point was that you know you can do the like the sort of more classic styles that you opened with in twenty sixteen that kind of cooled off and, and weren't as you know the cool kids weren't really after them for a bit. But they've kind of, I feel like West Coast IPAs are kind of like come back around again. Um, Nate and I are massive fans of uh, of West Coast and love to see more of it. So that makes me very happy. But I think it's also really dope that you can make a beer that would be in the realm of the, you know, the hype boys would uh, get excited about too. And you could, you know, easily do both of those styles to, to a very, very high level. I think that's really dope, man. Cause you haven't positioned, I, I say that to, because you're not, you haven't positioned yourself as like anything specific. So to be able to do them both at such a, such a high level, I think is a really, it's great. It's great for beer drinkers. It's great for the scene. It's great for you for the locals to discover new stuff as well, for people who just, you know, swing by to drink the cream out and they're like, Oh, what's this about? You know, you learn something. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The um, IPA before is we, a, uh, a good example. Oh, of brewing yeah. beers sorry. Are, sorry, Gavin, go ahead. Sorry. Cause, cause uh, I mean the IP, we got like bugged for 
it was, I think it was three years or maybe four before we made any kind of like hazy, juicy IPA because like we just, I just like West Coast IPAs and the, and the people at the brewery like West Coast IPAs. So that's what we made. So the, the hazy, juicy ones is one where we, we finally caved and gave into customers on that one. And we have a, like every six months now we have like a, like a new England IPA that we, we rotate through, but the West coast one stays all the time. Right. The Nate, go for it. No, I, I was just going to say it's i uh, I'm just looking at the time. It's probably time to grab the next beer. Yeah, we can do that. We, oh yeah. I forgot to tell you beforehand, Gavin, we're probably every about 30 minutes. We, uh, Crack it in the next one, which kind of works out nicely. Uh, which one are we doing next? So we've got a few different uh, options here. Happy for you to guide us uh, through it all. Uh, I think, I mean, we could do either of the IPAs because we were just talking about it. Do you want to do the, we got our uh, Aussie IPA, which is like a more of a hazy, less bitter one, or we've got our classic West Coast. What do you, what do you want to try? I wonder which one would go first. I reckon maybe even the... I would probably do... Yeah? Go. The, maybe the Aussie one first. Just because a little less say, bitter. Yeah. A little more... The, yeah. The I regular IP would kind of transition into the last one too, kind of nicely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I think I think that's a good yeah. call. Look at that, guys. Very All right, cool. Uh, All right. Be right back. You guys go grab them. That's no problem. Take your time. So uh, this is the next one, folks. Obviously, uh, this is... Close to my heart uh, here. Love to see it. Um, <laughs> what are the hops you got in here, dude? So this one is, uh, it's all Galaxy and Eclipse. I think, I think Eclipse is a newer variety, but uh, I really like it. I'm here for it, dude. That's awesome. Um, Eclipse, I always forget. I know Enigma's Aussie as well. So I guess there's like a whole bunch of like... Hops that are sort of less yeah. There's known. a lot. There's Enigma and Ella and uh, Big Secret. I'm trying to remember them, but there's yeah. I mean, there's probably a dozen Australian hops that you can get regularly now, but which uh, is great. Yeah, new hops are always fun. Oh, love that. that! Smells juicy. What uh, inspired this beer, man? So we um we had uh, I, like I mentioned earlier, kind of customer demand that we make a. Uh, easy one uh and we'd kind of been dabbling in different hops and things to use and we got some i mean galaxy was impossible to get for a good three or four years i think and then finally they kind of caught up and there's a good crop of galaxy that we got um kind of tempted with from our hop supplier and then they're pushing eclipse too because it's one of the new crop years they're like yeah I mean, they both smell great they both taste great let's just make a fuzzy hopped hazy IPA so mm -hmm. so we went for love it um this camera's killing me come on bro. you know what let me just do the uh, photo this way I'm just having a tech all sorts of issues yeah but this is looking this is looking great super like, oh, like yeah. straw lemon kind of color yeah this one is quite light in color yeah Great Did nose. you uh, say what the hops were already when I, uh, oh, as I was going to grab this? Yeah, it's it's uh, just Galaxy and Eclipse, so they're both Australian oh, okay. hops um, from last crop year. Yeah. Uh, I like it. I get a lot of pineapple, tons of pineapple out of it. Cheers, Bux. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, like a nice tropical nose. Um, oh yeah, it's got like um. It's not quite like hot burn, which I'm a huge, huge fan of, but there's something, there's something in this. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not astringent. Yeah. What is that? It's a, it's like, there's like a bit of a slightly acidic tingle at the end. I, th mm. I feel like that's what you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. I love that. What, 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 what are we, is it, I think it might be the galaxy because I think galaxy does that. It's like yeah. a real palate punchy. drying, yeah, punchy. It dries you up. It's like it takes everything out of your palate in a good way. I love the beers <laughs> that do that when they're really dry because you don't want it to be overly sweet and then it's harder to drink. You want it to be dry 
And I feel like the beers that have that element are often, they last a bit longer. Like there's like the hop and I feel like it, it could be the hop or that greenness that makes it last a bit longer. Or And, and I guess the Galaxy, just because it's such an intense ass hop, um, kind of does that. I don't, I don't know if, that, if we're uh, off on that, man. Yeah, no, I think that sounds right. For me, I mean, it's the same. I don't really like the New England IPAs that are like, they're almost syrupy because they're so sweet and so juicy. Mm. Uh, so I like kind of, I don't know. I mean, we our, our go-to one's a West Coast IPA, uh, which is definitely more bitter. So this one's, it's a New England IPA, but it's not it's not like super thick and sweet. It's, it's juicy, it's less bitter, but still, we, I mean, go for balance is what we're shooting for. Yeah, no, definitely. Absolutely. No, this is fantastic, man. Um, this one is like, this is just like one of those ones where you did like one or two new beers a month type of thing. That's what. Uh... This one was, uh, we do a six month flip flop with hazy IPAs. So last one was uh, our juicy IPA, I think. And then we had this one, which actually this is probably the like the last couple cans of it. And then next month we're launching a hazy IPA where we partnered with the food bank. So we're going to be donating the, a lot of the proceeds from that to the food bank oh, that's awesome. for six months. Nice. Um, what do you, uh, so was that also a hazy beer you said? Or that was something completely different? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. upcoming one's going to be another hazy IPA. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Nice. Um, what's the response? How was the response to this one? It was good. Yeah, it was it was pretty popular. I think we uh yeah, we ran in the tap room for uh six months and we had to do a bunch of batches of it, so <laughs> people liked it, I hope. That's awesome. I love it. Um Nice. Yeah, th- this is great. I love seeing the uh the the different sort of hop options as well. I'm I'd be excited to try this next to the uh the regular IPA and see how that goes. But yeah, dude, this is awesome. So, when did you do the first hazy one? You said it was a few uh, people were kind of bugging you for a bit. I think it was right before the pandemic. Is probably when we did our first hazy IPA, or it might have even been during. But we we uh, we stubbornly held out for at least three years, just because it's not my favorite style. But uh, a couple of the new brewers like them, so we finally caved. Makes sense, man. It makes sense. Look, this, this is killer, and this is kind of what I was getting at before, that the, you know, the fact that you guys do this, and this is something that, you know, both Nate and I are, are pretty into. We're sort of into a lot of stuff, though, and I just, I respect the breweries that can do all of these things super well, because I don't think any of it is easy, you know, particularly like the Sum of the Pills, which I've had before, thanks to Nate. It's fantastic. You're doing this type of haze that's it's almost like you, you, you're hitting all the notes that maybe like the Hayes boys want, but then it's still really approachable. Like it's not like too intense. Like it's just where it needs to be where I'm like, it satiates those who maybe got more experience with it. But if you've got someone coming in who's maybe a bit newer to it, it's not going to turn them off completely, um, which is very key, which is very cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's got, I mean, I'm not going to throw like a, pound of flour and to make it hazier for the the hype the hype train or anything yeah, but i think yeah. the people who think west coast are too bitter but still want something with more character i think this is a perfect fit for for something like that yeah um i, I think so yeah yeah people actually do do that flour thing i heard it was a real thing from um the milkshake ipa days i don't know if anyone's doing it now yeah. but it, that, that was pretty funny i hope not I think uh, I think people have figured out how to do it without having to chuck flour in it now, which is just carbs. You're just like drinking <laughs> bread already. You're just adding more carbs to it. Like fuck, man. Um, what was I going to say? <laughs> so the the actual um, the London Ontario. I don't think we've really had any or many breweries on from London. Surprisingly, now and I think this would be the first. I'm pretty sure. The only one I can think of is Equals, but they're not. They're more. They're a uh, contract as opposed to they do their own stuff really so don't know why that happened so this is great so i'm definitely would like to learn more about um uh, about the scene out there so tell us about as far as the london craft beer scene man i'd love to hear about sort of where it's at like is it its own sort of like microcosm of the whole of ontario or canada at large like 
where's the palette at like a people is there like a style obviously maybe it sounds like cream else kind of popping out there but are there some styles that um people are into is craft beer really popping out there or is it kind of a slow grind like what's the landscape yeah i think it's it's probably a bit behind uh parts of the province like toronto for sure i mean it, it's uh not surprising that london always gets kind of separated we're just like a city surrounded by like three hours of farmland in every direction so uh <laughs> it's hard to get people from toronto and farther abroad interested too because like oh it's a two-hour drive it's like it takes you two hours to drive like halfway across the city like it's not that bad it's actually not but that's, um that's facts. no the, the london beer scene yeah <laughs> the london beer scene is is uh it's it's really ramping up i think like when we moved in there was uh, Forked River was the first brewery in London. So they, I think they they were there two or three years before we were. And then Toboggan was there before us, but the, it's a brew pub downtown. Mm -hmm. And so then we were in there and then London Brewing uh, Co-op moved in across the street from us like a year later, I believe. Okay. And then uh, we have Beer Lab downtown. Now Storm stayed. There's Curly Brewing, which is like a, a really micro micro and um uh powerhouse moved in also like across the street from us and then dundas and sons i think that's it maybe if i said storm state already i think i did, yeah, did. but so we've gone yeah. from like two or three breweries to seven or eight in the in the four or five years so i mean for a city this size seven or eight breweries is still peanuts compared to a lot of other parts in ontario but it's uh, I think there's I think there's a couple more you hear rumors all the time of a few more in the works so I wouldn't be surprised if a few more pop up but it's still good it's it's uh I mean the more breweries the more people in London are getting exposed to craft beer and I think they're a little behind the rest of the province and transitioning over so it's uh it's still a, a brave new world here hmm I've heard of almost all of those breweries too I didn't realize most of those guys were in London so that's pretty cool, man. It sounds like there's like what three or four near you to make it like the perfect, uh, you know, crawl kind of scenario out there. Oh yeah, for sure. Like I think from our place, there's like a one is across the street and one is like across the street from there. So you can take an Uber down and then hit three breweries with like a two minute walk and and then head to a different part of town. That's money. That's um. Well, that's great. Uh, yeah, I imagine that's done you <laughs> done you some favors. Like that's been a unlike any other industry. If if your competition moved in across the street, you'd be pretty upset. But in the beer world, it's uh, I can imagine that being a, a positive thing. People want to you know you're a drink you're you're a brewery owner and a brewer, but you're a drinker too, and everyone wants variety and to try different things and like to make an afternoon or a day of it or whatever it might be. If you're able to do all of that, that's pretty sick. Like you could basically be there all day, all night, and hit the three spots. I love that. Yeah, it's it's pretty nice. I mean, pre-COVID, we were working together on like walking tours and trying to get tour buses in and things like that to bring people in the neighborhood. But then that kind of all was derailed, and and now we're we're slowly working back to to that point. Mm. Okay, that yeah, sucks. Of course. But hopefully, that's able to to kick back in. Um, as far as the drink is then in London. It sounds like, you know, it's a pretty big city. It's like half a million plus. I've been to London like two or three times. It's it's not small, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, where is the palette sort of sitting? Like, would you say there's a lot of, um, I haven't had a ton of, I know of most of, the, most of those breweries you mentioned, but I, I haven't had a ton of them. Would you say that there's like, is there like a, a, a bit of a mix? I mean, obviously there's always a mix, but is it sort of leaning towards, is there like more gateway drinkers that sort of are looking for a way in or like, you know, where do you think the, where, where are most people at? Like what are people typically looking for? Yeah, I guess I would say it would be pretty hard for a brewery in London to kind of be doing well without, a super accessible option. Okay. So I don't, I don't think we're at the point where you could have a brewery that just does hazy IPAs or just does barrel aged sours or things like that. I'm not sure you get enough traction yet. Gotcha. So, I mean, there's like, we, you, we just tried our cream ale. that's super crushable and easygoing beer. 
but we had to make like a full-time beer that's lighter than that because uh, a lot of people would still find that a little too intimidating. Hmm. So I think, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of people that have not had a ton of exposure to craft beer, but there's also a lot of people that can appreciate a great IPA and, and a great sour beer. And uh, so it's, I don't know. It's a mix. I think that, yeah, I think there's, there's people of all flavors, but you, you definitely have to have a light lager. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, that's fair enough. I feel like across the board, they seem to be popping up a lot. You know, that sort of 3.5 to 4.5% type of thing. Um, Interesting to hear you say cream ale is intimidating. That's, um, but I guess I can see that if people are kind of new to beer and they're used to, you know, the macro options, maybe they're, it just kind of feels scary. But, yeah, it's. But I feel it's, like. I mean, but but only, I, 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 like we were talking about before. I, I feel like that's almost um, like that's almost just for, like just from an assumption on the style name than it, like than anything else. If this had been um, like if if it was not called a cream ale, if it was just uh, like you know like if it was just going by like by kind of a more generic like lagered ale, I don't think that you'd. Uh, like that, there would probably be the same hesitation. Um, m- maybe I'm wrong on that. Would you uh, like, or, like? Do you think that's it, or is it something else that uh, like that makes it intimidating to some? It's hard to say. I mean, there is a a good amount of I think perception that's that's really mental, like placebo effect or something like that. But working yeah. in the tap room, it 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 really surprised me the amount of people that would say like what's your lightest beer and we give them a cream ale and they drink it and be like oh it's so bitter you just be like oh really <laughs> this this one so yeah wow okay <laughs> and what do those people typically drink the people who say that like what what's what are, what are they into I, it must be just i think like a bud light coors light like those beers are i mean they're 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 rel- they're pretty low IBUs, like single digit IBUs. So it's even yeah. like twenty IBU when it's balanced might be kind of shocking to them. Interesting. I mean, I guess so. I haven't had a beer like that for a while, but I mean, I guess so. I just feel like cream ales are just so inherently inoffensive that like calling that oh, it's so bitter is like odd. <laughs> Although I guess, like I, yeah. I guess too, the, the like kind of the heftier, like the heftier malt bill, and uh, the, and like a bit sweeter, like you were saying, if you're like if you are really used to a light lager, that could, like I, I could actually see as we're talking it out that like how that might be a little off putting if you're like if you're used to light lagers all the time. Yeah. No, I, I guess I get it. Yeah, that's a good point. It could be definitely be just like a maybe a lack of like terminology knowledge where they're saying it's too bitter, but what they really mean is it's like too much body or too malty or they give a ton of people too that try a stout and they're like, Oh, that's so strong. It's like, buddy, it's like three and a half percent. It's not that strong, but it's just like, <laughs> if you don't really know the right. words to describe it, it maybe it maybe it, I don't know. That's a good point, man. Yep. I guess we're all such, we're all been in it too long to know what that's really like anymore to sort of be like shocked by these things um have you ever have you like a beer like this one of my like i always tell this story but we're in new york with uh, my girlfriend's friend who's a wine drinker she she lived there she's from here she was living there at the time so we were out somewhere and they had other half so obviously i was grabbing that and she was like oh can i try it why does it look like that I'm like sure and she lost her mind because she's saying a white wine drinker and she loved that it was kind of tropical, it wasn't bitter, it was like a nice mouthfeel. Like, I feel like a, a beer like this, like a, a New England style IPA, is an underrated, um, what do we call it again? Why am I having a, a like, um, gateway beer? Because of that inoffensiveness, because it's not bitter, because it's sort of s- sweet and fruity, when people think about IPAs, they think of bitter, uh, and they don't, you know. I mean, they can be. They're not really like that anymore. But yeah, I wonder if has this stuff ever sort of been a that bridge for people? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, that was one of the most fun parts about working in the tap room because with our license, we can only sell what we make on site. So no wine, no uh, no like seltzers, no ciders, no anything like that. So if someone comes in, they're like, "I don't like beer. What should I have?" It's like, "Oh yeah, here we go." And you can try like some people they just want the gold lager. Some people want 
uh, like they go for the hazy IPA because of the fruit and like the juiciness, low bitterness. Fruit sours is usually easy sell again because it's, I mean, it is more wine like with lower pH and, and super low bitterness and fruity flavors. It's surprising how many people go for um, uh, like brown ales or stouts. Like they, they think they don't like beer. It's like, well, do you drink coffee? They're like, I love coffee. It's like, try a stout. They're like, what? This tastes like coffee. It's like, that's, that's amazing. Um, that's cute. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I think that for, it seems like a lot of the gateway beers, it's it bitterness seems to be the turnoff, I think. And it just seems to be a lot of people in life. Like people, some people hate broccoli, hate Brussels sprouts. Cause like those vegetables are more bitter. It's like for me, like I crushed a pound of Brussels sprouts for dinner tonight. I don't <laughs> care. I'll drink a bunch of double IPAs, but <laughs> for some people that's a, that's a total deal breaker. I mean, that's yep. fair. Like you said though, Almost everybody drinks coffee. Coffee, coffee is bitter as shit. So like, and significantly more bitter. Yeah, it's true. Argue. But some people drink coffee with like fifteen sugars. In it. <laughs> Dude, yeah, you're so yeah, right. That's right. The uh, the old Tim Hortons and Starbucks culture <laughs> with the uh, double doubles and and all the fucking frappuccino, which I'm actually not mad at. But I like third wave coffee. I want to taste the coffee. It's glorious. Um, yeah, it's just an interesting thing because I also feel like this is a bit of a segue here. Um, one thing I've always really appreciated about you guys is the branding. And I feel like your branding is appealing to all markets. And I, I'm bringing up the gateway stuff a bunch just because I, I always had the feeling that this is something that's important to you guys. And maybe also because of where you're based, like maybe that's what, what's needed in London to kind of grow it out. But then you told me how many breweries are there. And I know some of those are you know, I know Beer Lab are definitely aimed more towards the kind of, you know, beer nerd crowd. So it seems like you've got a, a fair uh, wide range out there, which is fantastic. But your branding, dude, like I, I think it's sick. I just love simplicity. I think everything in the world is complex and confusing. And it's a lot with these just white cans. I mean, for those listening, white cans with black writing and then each different uh, above and below each of the beer names is different colored straight line. Um Talk us through the branding concepts and sort of what the intention was. Sure. I think, I mean, it's a combination of things is that one, uh, I'm not very creative. And <laughs> number two is that I just sing with <laughs> I like simple things. Like I like to, I like to know what I'm getting. I like, uh, I, I don't know. So for, it, it drive me nuts. Like, um, before we opened the brewery where we'd go to like a beer bar or whatever and look at the menu and it's like, Oh, do you want to try the uh, like honking dog? Or do you want to try this like triple goose or whatever? And it's like, and you ask the server, like, what's this one? And they're like, Oh, it's a, uh, it's like a craft beer. You're like, oh, okay, that doesn't help me. Um, so <laughs> so I, I wanted, like, I like you go to a place and you see our beer on the menu and it's like, it's cream ale. It's, it's going to be a cream ale. You get a, like you get a IPA, it's going to be IPA. You get a brown ale, it's going to be probably going to be a brown ale. So if, if that was that was a lot of it, I think. And yeah, I just like stuff very clean, very simple to the point. That's just kind of the, I don't know. That's what I like personally. So that's what we do. Hey man, yeah, you, awesome. you you definitely know, definitely know what you're getting. It's uh, yeah, like it's it's clean. It's like it's simple and like it works. It's um, it, like it, it's a good concept that has kind of it's it, like I, I feel it's what your uh, like kind of your brand has been like has become synonymous with just this just kind of this clean and um, the, like clean and simple branding with like really well executed styles um, it, it, like it's to me it's kind of it, like it's kind of what your brand is known for and I, I, I think it really works while we're talking about yeah, I the think, uh, uh so, sorry go ahead i was just saying like the breweries with the really creative label designs like colorful stuff like i can't imagine the pressure every time you have a new beer trying to come up with like a really cool label like how do we make this one look cool it's, i don't know what's cool like i got a plain gray shirt oh, i wear cargo shorts we just i can't <laughs> don't leave me in charge of making cool stuff Let's just let's yeah. just tell people what they're getting. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 wild. Um, 
without going into this too much, but uh, like a, a friend of ours, um, Jacob, who uh, like who's the, like one of the owners of Saint Yam Baron in uh, like in Elmer, Quebec. He's a graphic designer by trade, and um, they, they like. They, they, their whole process with their with their beer naming is like, like like someone thinks of a name and Jacob comes up with like with a label design like built around that and then sometimes like the recipe design has come to fit what like what like what he does on that label it's, there's a whole process behind it and it's just wild um, but like and it get, like it sounds, it sounds like it gets dreadful. very stressful and hectic at times <laughs> <laughs> I, I get that it's. Re- Go on, Nate. Um, yes. So, so as we're talking about the labels here, um, I, I wanted to talk about the packaging because um, you're one of the few breweries in Ontario um, that exclusively does short cans, and um, and basically everywhere that your uh, like that your stuff is available, it's uh, it, uh, like it's available in a six pack of short cans, which is particularly unusual um in the lcbo um that they like the lcbo loves their uh, like loves their single tall cans yeah um was it uh was it a challenge getting into the lcbo with a six pack of short cans did they like did you get any resistance to that or what like how did that um how did that come about to keep that kind of consistent packaging uh it was a major challenge for sure i think so for me, when I was, um, my background, like I, I lived in the States for six years. That's where I was doing a, a PhD in microbiology. And there it's like, everything was there, short can six packs. Like that's just the, the beer format. And I, I just grew to like it. It's super convenient. Mm-hmm. Like you, for me, when I'm going to buy beer, 80% of the time, it's like Friday at 5 30 PM. And I just want to go in and grab a six pack of something and head home for the weekend. Mm-hmm. And so when we got back here, I wanted to kind of continue that. And that's the format that I liked and that's what I wanted to do. But uh, the LCBO put up a, a, a really big fuss about that. And they said, well, it doesn't, it doesn't sell. It's like, we, we only, only tall can sell. It's like, well, how many six packs short cans have you approved? And they're like, well, none, but that's cause like, then how do you know it doesn't sell? So they kind of agreed to let us try it and they're probably <laughs> expecting it to just go down in flames. But uh I don't know. It's it's worked pretty well. I think there's a decent amount of people that like short cans. Mm. I think short cans are the coolest thing ever. Like, I feel like they are, allow you to sort of, even if they're stronger beers, it's like okay, well, if it's a, you put an eleven percent imperial stout or something in there, cool. That's probably just enough for one portion because I personally don't really want you know a total can or five hundred mil bottle or whatever of that because then it's like harder you got to share it or whatever um for these smaller cans i feel like you have i order tonight like looking forward to this podcast i was like ah sick we got four different beers i'm like boom boom that's like it's it's easy it's a nice it's it's crushable it's not too much like you know it's perfect for the format of this podcast like i've been able to comfortably drink those two beers without Blah, 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 like knocking them back or whatever in the half an hour that we're sort of out, you know, for each beer. Usually I'd have some and I'd be like, oh, we're on to the next. Cool. And I'll, I'll finish them after. But I've been able to do that. Um, obviously, you're also very approachable with the style. So it also, that plays into it, sort of approachable beers. You want six of the cream now. You don't just want one of them, right? Like it's a, it's, it's a different like mindset that you're appealing to, even with a beer like we just had, like a hazy IPA. It's great. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised too because we we do some stuff like we have uh, we had a like a ten percent um, Mexican kind of chocolate stout with ancho chilies and coconut and cocoa nibs and vanilla and all that jazz. Nice. And people would still buy buy the six pack and didn't didn't bat an eye. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just a convenience factor, I guess. Yeah, there's something I don't know. I like that you brought that up, Nate. Though, like that, that it's something that like you know. I feel like it, they're coming back more and more and maybe breweries will have a specific style or something that will go in the short cans as opposed to like keeping the whole run shorties. There's a few that do it, um, but not that many. And I can't, I think it's kind of ballsy to just be like, you can't get one. You got to get six of them and they're all shorties and here it is. Um, I think that's pretty dope. I'd like to, 
like I don't know. There's something about that that's sort of almost like this is what it is. Like it's like a, all right. You know, you go to those breweries sometimes and everything's like, Nate will align with this, where you got to buy everything in a four pack and it's four tall cans. I get it. I, as a, like, I own a business. As a business owner, I get the point of it. As a consumer, don't love it. Would typically want one, maybe two of anything. I like the variety of it. But there's something about the short and, cans. Uh, like, and... And generally, the breweries that are sell like that are making you buy it in those four packs, you're like you're spending twenty to twenty five bucks a four pack too, <laughs> minimum. So it can add up a bit, and it's just like a different approach. It's not. Yeah. I'm not really saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying I just you know there's different circumstances call for different packaging, and uh, if you're able to just be like this is what it is, but, and that it still sells, I like that. Like our stuff too. Like you can come in the tap room and buy one can. That, that's fine. You can go in the LCBO. You can crack one off a six pack and go buy one can. You're, oh, you're yeah. allowed to. No one's going to stop you. But I just find a six pack is just more convenient. I don't know. I yeah. get it. And, and and especially too. Like uh, the, the, this is another thing that I like that I love about this. And I'm assuming this is deliberate. But uh, like you know, when I go and see the like the, those attractive, clean labeled cans in a six pack, and you know, even the like even the pack holder is the same. Like is usually the same color as the like as those two lines on there. It's uh, the, the, like it's. Oh, but, like, like it's great. Like what? Like when I go in, like when I go into the LCBO and I'm grabbing like the six pack of that Marzen Lager and it's got the orange cap on it. I love that. It's like it. It just all fits. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the few aspects of our branding that is deliberate. Is that I make sure that the lines on the can, the two tiny lines, match the color of the pack deck. <laughs> yeah. Attention that's to dope. detail, man. It's the small things. Uh... <laughs> In the, I didn't notice that. I'm gonna double check um, with the other one. I, that that's sick, man. I feel like I don't even see six packs too often. I feel like even six packs in and of themselves are a rarity. I, I can't even think of another beer that intentionally comes in six packs off the top of my head. So there's, uh, I like it. It all makes sense. Next beer, eh? Looking at the time. Yeah, next beer. We doing the so brown ale now. Brown Let's or IPA? Brown. We're browning it up. I, 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 would, I would say probably brown ale, and then we, and then we finish with the bitter. Uh, does that sound, does that sound right to you, Gavin? Yeah, I think so. Yep, that works Love for me. It. All right, let's do Look it. Look at that. As expected, the lines are brown. Look at that. Get that in you. So the brown ale to me is fascinating. I feel like. Also, I want to put this Australian flag up now because I got that out. I reckon this will look cool here. What do you reckon? Look at that. The fuck it's Australian, man. Bloody rip, but that is. Um, <laughs> I saw it on the floor when we were drinking the Aussie one. I was like, oh, yeah, I got these flags. Um, brown ales. This is fascinating to me. Um, this is a style definitely like kind of what Nate was saying earlier. It's one of the styles that was, you know, was hitting back in the day. Um, I loved brown ales, not browns. Ambers, all that kind of like, you know, pre porter stout kind of middle ground beers. I was always a huge fan of them. Um, I don't get them enough now, and I feel like whenever I have a brown now, I'm always like, ooh, where have they been? Um, what's, the, <laughs> what's the vibes with the brown now, dude? Like, how's the, uh, what's the yeah. response now? Like, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, for me, our brown ale is 100% my the favorite my favorite beer that we make, but it's also 100% like our worst selling one. Kind of a, <laughs> a, a, Go figure. Know. Well, it kind of makes sense. Like it's, yeah, it's like the forgotten stepchild of, of beer styles. I think like people who who like that roasty chocolatey flavor, they go for the more intense stouts, and people yeah. who don't, they just they won't try brown. It's kind of an in-between style. I'm not sure. There's not many people where that's their real go-to is a brown ale. I think years ago it would have been for sure, but now it's just it's just a different different time. I remember back in the day, like you you wouldn't catch a brewery that didn't make a brown ale. Like it was mandatory. I, I would probably say. 
and especially in Quebec too. That was my, mm-hmm. the, like the, the, that was one of the things where it was like you you couldn't find a brewery that didn't make a brown ale. You reckon? Uh, like seven eight years ago in Quebec. Really? Eh? I mean, I just moved from Quebec, and I don't recall that. I remember him here more because Ontario is more English. So maybe I I missed the brown ale wave. Well, it was like kind of along, like, like kind of along with the roosters as well, uh, like as well, right? Like it was uh, uh, when, when, when kind of uh, when everyone was all, like kind of sticking along those uh, like those classic lines. That is fair. The roost was, uh, and still to this day, I saw other, I, I saw breweries like this week promote their new roost, which is an interesting. You know, I guess you're familiar with that. Gather the roost is like the red ale. It's like a red ale and a cream ale kind of mixed it's an interesting mm-hmm. like an irish red and cream ale um yeah like brown well, first of all i'm i'm dying to sip this can we can we sip once nate's got that photo yeah get the photo cheers boys. Yep, no no i'm here i'm here all right okay. we're good cheers get a brown ale in you oh man fantastic the aroma on this is delightly delightful yeah. there's something about brown ales man like I don't know why I've got like a real soft spot for him. It's uh, yeah. T- talk us through yeah, this, dude. I, like it, like I said, it's my favorite style. Yeah, but it's got I don't know. I've had people describe it as like kind of like coffee crisp. Like it's just it's got that kind of uh, roastiness, like milk chocolate, not like the dark chocolate, but it's a nuttiness. Like it's just got all the good stuff. It's like a nice like bread. Yeah. Bread's good, but toast toast is awesome. And it, this is just like the toast <laughs> of beer, I think. The toast of you know what rum. it's That's it's awesome. got all of like it's got all of those notes <laughs> without like kind of without the sweetness or heaviness uh like of when you would have a stout with the like with yeah. the same flavors it's got the espresso it's got the chocolate um but it is dry and light on the palate mm-hmm. yeah, coffee, it's not like coffee beer. crisp is a really yeah. coffee crisp is a really good descriptor for it actually yeah because it's got the bitterness, yeah. and it's got the, the chocolatey, like you said, without being like that dark chocolate. It's like, but it's super crisp and light. Like, it's got the lager feel. Like, it's only 4.6. Mm-hmm. So, it's very crushable. Touch bitter. It's, um, yeah, basically chocolate and coffee with a little nuttiness in there. It's it's glorious. Like it's such a great mix. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's my favorite beer. I just just wish people would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a flagship. They have no choice. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I, I really like this. What's the um like? What's the general vibe when you sort of try to suggest the brown ale to people? Are they sort of open? To it or? Yeah, I think people will try it. I've had a few like people who come in and say they don't like beer, and we've been able to sell them on this one because it is kind of like milk chocolate coffee. It's not too bitter, but it has like a lot of complexity. But most people, I think it's kind of what I was saying before. If people like chocolate and coffee, they like a stout because it's like a punch of chocolate and coffee in your face. They don't want like a like a little sprinkle of chocolate and coffee. But uh, and people who don't like that, they'll go from like an amber or something more caramelly, and they'll stay away from the the roasty notes. I get it. It's it's like a. Do you know what it is, though, man? I feel like I'd be curious. Like Nate and I got. It sounds like you're into beer before us. Like I started my little the selfie things in twenty January twenty eleven. I was drinking beer before that. Nothing crazy discovered craft beer from then so i consider that sort of my era and that was the era where you were drinking european light lagers then you discovered amber ales like whoa look at the flavor then you got into brown ales and brown ales were a big part of the step up into the darker beer it was a very gradual like it wasn't lagers to pastry stouts it was like you know you had to amber brown porter stout you know um like the brown ales came right came right before all of the Belgians that, that like that yes. were in the LCBO at the time, right? Yeah, and it was just like a really I don't know, like I don't know if important is the word, but just like a key part of the craft beer journey a decade or so ago. Like you couldn't escape it; it was just a part of it. Everywhere you went, almost every brewery would have a brown ale. You'd kind of be surprised if they didn't, and they almost like. 
if I think of it, like, have you had a shit brown ale? Like, it's really bad. Like, I can never think of one. You can think of one that had maybe a bad lager or a really bad IPA or whatever, but I can't really think of one like, oh, that brown ale was horrible. I feel like they're just this, like, always kind of acceptable, like, you know, maybe there's a wavering, some are super fire, some not so good, but, like, generally it's a style that, like, not that you can't miss, but, you know, they're pretty consistent across the board. I don't know. Maybe I'm making that up. I think that seems reasonable. I mean, some styles, like a lager is so light and clean that if you have any problems with your process or fermentation, like it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. And then IPAs, like if your hop timing's messed up or if you have a bad batch of hops, like there's so much in it that it's also going to be very noticeable. But brown is just like, I mean, a lot of browns just take, 10 different malts and throw them in a pot and you got a brown ale. So <laughs> <laughs> and there's one enough, thing, like there's enough complexity to cover up small mistakes, but they're, you're not adding so much of one ingredient that if something's wrong, it's going to stand out. So maybe that's why they're popular with like new microbreweries is because you can just, it's hard to go wrong with them. Mm. Yeah. No, that's a good point. One thing that I find can get like, can sometimes go wrong with brown ales, and this might be more of an like more of an issue of packaging than an actual brewing process, but it's one of those ones that I feel like if something is a little bit off in it, it can really like it can kind of sometimes get that tinny taste to it. Um, it, like sure. if something's like, if something's not quite going like going right in the packaging, it's like for some like for some reason, and maybe it's because it's a bit. Uh, like it's a bit milder generally or maybe like maybe it just kind of like really just accentuates it but if something's a little bit off there like a tinny flavor will really really stand out in a brown ale i find yeah it's really interesting you mentioned that because that's one thing that has always really bothered me and it seems like a lot of people just can't detect it or don't notice it or don't care but i've found that like beers if you use a lot of uh more heavily like more darker crystal malts without other stuff to balance it out like those always have this weird like metallic flavor that just i just can't stand it's mm -hmm. like a beer like with a bunch of pennies at the bottom or something like that i just yeah that's it yeah i think that it's the dark crystal malts without anything else to balance it out is what i found causes that interesting i do there you go that's really interesting yeah i remember now you're saying that uh, it's an interesting one nate that like i remember back in the day once again 2011 2012 there was a bro i don't want to because they're not they don't do this anymore. There was a brewery I remember drinking a lot of back then from Ontario that almost all of their beers had that metallic taste, regardless of the hmm. the style. And I never understood why. It's completely gone now, but it was something maybe back then, so it could have been something to do with the malt bill or something like that. But you, I see what you mean with the brown ale. So I'm thinking about that as you were talking. I was like, where, what place – does the brown ale have in craft beer in 2022? I don't know. I mean, judging from our sales, not, not much of a place. <laughs> 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 but it, I, I, like, it's a, I think it's, it's like, it's gone from a, a staple in craft breweries to like, I, I feel like is a pretty underserved market now. Like there's people who love brown ales. There's not many of them, but they do and they can't find them. So I'm not sure. Like IPAs are still probably half of all craft beer sales across like the whole province. Mm, and yeah. then like the people who don't like IPAs a lot, like maybe 30, 40% of them take lagers. And so that last like 10 or 15% is every other beer style. So I don't yeah. know. There's not a lot of brown, like go to brown drinkers out there, but yeah. yeah. Where, where are they at? Where are they at? I don't even like, bro, this is like, I was, if, I'm not even going to lie, like the beer I was most looking forward to tonight was this beer because I feel <laughs> like I hadn't had a brown ale in so long. And I don't think I ever had a brown, like I said before, a brown ale that I didn't like. And I feel like there's something that recently, I don't know if Nate and I, you, you and I have been talking about it, dude, but like, I feel like there's like a bit of a full circle moment in beer in the last year or two, you know, coming back to crispies. Like now, if you know, you go through the whole color wheel then you end up at the belgian stuff and blah 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 you know you go through the trends and everything and then it's all coming back to now crispies like that's something that i'm passionate about nate and i just did an episode on october fest beers like marzins and fest beers and and all that type of stuff and i feel like brown ales are sort of in that category of things that i enjoyed like a lot back in the day 
but don't really see nor get to drink very often. And when you get one that's fire like this one, like this is glorious. Like it tastes this to me. It's almost like if you didn't, if I didn't know it was an ale, I'd, I'd be, I'd swear on everything it was a lager. It's just so crisp and dry. It's um, it's fantastic. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I think I don't know. Like I, I, most people I've talked to have been into craft beer for a while. Everybody's got the same kind of curve where like they they only drink macro beers and then they get into something like a cream ale or a lager or whatever and they're like, oh, this is really good. Then they'll try like an amber. Like you said, they'll try a brown. Then they'll get an IPA and like, oh, what, like what is this? And then they'll get like a double IPA and a triple IPA and the hazy IPAs and like the the stouts and the burn barrel aged stouts. And after a while, they're just like that. I'm good. Like I, I tried it. I just want loggers again now. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, that makes That's sense. It. It's very intense. It's, it's quite the journey. Um, particularly one thing I do like on, on this note though, when you're talking about that, the journey you described is all of our journey because that's what happened back then. I've heard from people and it makes sense. If you're a noob to craft beer in this year, 2022, or whatever, you're going to maybe you know, try a lager, but you'll be trying haze. You'll be trying smoothie sours. You'll be trying pastry stouts. Like you'll kind of skip all of that like middle ground. You probably won't touch the Belgians. There's probably people who like line up for pastry stouts and smoothies and stuff that's never tried a Belgian beer or that's never had an amber, a brown, a porter. Like they skipped or, or wheat or wit or all that shit. Like they've sort of skipped this sort of thing that there wasn't a way around that back in the day. Like if you were trying to explore beer, you just had to go through that. And it just, there wasn't like a, the closest thing to, there was nothing like hype or exciting. The closest was like the West letter and, you know, Trappist stuff, may, maybe, or Hedy Topper or whatever, when it was like peaking back in like 2014, 15 type of thing. Like that was it. So I feel like the, the people who are getting into beer now tend to skip this stuff and they may not have, you know, be giving a brown ale or an amber or some of these other styles that really do have, or cream ale, you know? have some a lot of value and a, and a great place in beer historically they're not even really getting to try it to see how they feel about it they're just going straight to hype town you know so it's a different type yeah it, it's tough i mean it, it seems like there's you can kind of feel like oh how can you go right for pastry stouts and you you can't like appreciate the basics and stuff like that but on the same side of thing it's like it's like criticizing people for getting a like an iphone for their first phone it's like did you even use a rotary phone like you can't appreciate an iphone so it's i don't know yeah i don't know it's oh it's man crazy. that's that's an incredible comparison that's exactly yeah. what it is okay i get it I no get that's it. really good that's really good and like ultimately i don't they like that that's a really good point because i don't think there's any one correct way to enjoy craft beer, like mm. whatever, like whatever journey you like you went on, like that's great. It's like you know you you don't have to go through a rite of passage to uh, like to enjoy craft beer. Whatever, however you came into it, whatever like like whatever style you want, you like you wind up drinking first, and wherever that ends up landing you, that's good. Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah, I think I mean it's the same thing. Like just do. Do what you like, drink what you like, drink what you enjoy. It doesn't matter. Like my son is uh, is nine. He, like he's into video games now and playing some of the Zelda games. Like, oh, you got to go back and try like the original NES like Zelda game. Like it's a classic. And you play for five minutes. It's like, this game's hard and it sucks and I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> like, so <laughs> it's like, it just makes you think like, why, like, why do you need to go back and do that? Because it like, I mean, the world has moved on from that. There's... Yeah. There's new styles. Maybe you can skip that and still appreciate the new stuff that comes out. So. Hmm. Absolutely. That's a really good point. It's funny you mentioned Zelda. I don't know where I heard it. It was on a podcast or something the other day. And they were like, have you tried to go back and play the old Nintendo or Super Nintendo games? They go, they're fucking hard. Yeah, and yeah, they, yes. go, they go, the <laughs> thing is, if you die, you go back to the beginning. And all of that work is done. But I'm not a video game guy at all. But they go now with the games if you die you just oh respawn exactly where you are and apparently this is coming from the conversation about oh the kids are i've got it easy but they like they don't have that hardship that we had where it was hard to get good beer and like it's hard to play video games it's like everything's like easy but you can't criticize them for being born into a world where 
that's all they know. Like you're right. Why should they have it harder? And that it, like it, and, and that is a very like good example to bring up because old school like, like old school games are fucking savage with that <laughs> like, like, like that's like because that's exactly like that's exactly what it is. It's the like you could spend hours going th- like going through if you don't use any of the shortcuts all of the, like all of the worlds of uh, like of Super Mario Bros and whatnot. And if you happen to run out of lives on World Seven, you're fucked. And then, uh, like, and then your only thing to do is to start over again from the beginning. Like, that is brutal. <laughs> we, I mean, that's we had it. Like twenty years ago, you want a good craft beer, you might have to drive like six hours across Ontario to find it. Like, are people yeah. spoiled these days because they can go into LCBO and get like a hundred of them? I yeah, mean, but it's, it's great. So who cares? Or you, like, <laughs> or you know, I like I can hop online and uh, like and order uh, like a case of Anderson Craft Ales, right? Like, and it'll come right to my front door like like three or four days later. Like it, it, it's it, like like it's that easy now. <laughs> it, it's where true. like whereas but like whereas the first time I went to like to Anderson in 2017, all I could do was like drive like drive like eight hours out to London <laughs> to uh, like to have the visit that first time. These kids don't know how the, how good they have it these days. <laughs> Modern day cheat codes, <laughs> right? I I get it. I definitely. Uh... The old man in me feels like there's some part of it that I think there's a there's value in going through the process, like understanding that things were like how do I say it? Because I, I feel like this about everything in life, like even music. Like I grew up in Australia as a hip hop fan. I had to pay forty dollars for import CDs that weren't released in the com- country, or I have to pay three, four x the the cover price on the magazine that was three months late. Because that's all we could get our hands on. But now everything's online. Everything's on Spotify and Apple Music immediately. So it was like, we had to not suffer, but like anytime you got anything, it was a, it was a, an event. If I got that CD and I spent my 40 hard dollars when I was earning $5 an hour and whatever, like that's, that's something significant, you know? Trying to find that craft beer that like you had to drive across or whatever. You know, I lived in Quebec for 10 years. I just moved back to Ontario you still can't get mail order beer in Quebec. You still can't do it. Yeah. So like coming to Ontario, I've just done it for the fuck of it because I'm like, I just love the concept that you can do it here. It's the coolest shit in the world to me to be able to do that. But like, I think there's an, it's not even about the suffering. Cause obviously if you can avoid new generations from having to deal with any hardships, I'm well, that's what the point of progress is. Particularly the greatest example, like you said before, Gavin was like the iPhone versus a Nokia flip phone or whatever. Like, you know, why should you do the three C next button? You know, hit a three. Go back to T nine. <laughs> yeah, like that. That is, it's funny, but like, why should anybody do that? I guess there is value in understanding the history of something, knowing that hey, man, like beer was just macro lagers, but it, there was also these other things as opposed to going straight to the hype stuff, just for context to be like, oh yeah. I know this exists. This is cool. I know what these things are. Otherwise, you're going to be drinking all this hype stuff. You could ask somebody in a line, wait, you know, camping out to, to buy a hype release stuff. And what's a brown now? I don't know. Never heard of it. Who makes the it? Thing, many, you know. The thing is, is that like whatever the topic is, whether it's beer, whether it's video games, whether it's like whether it's music, is that every generation is always going to have like is always going to have the thing that they're going to work a little bit harder for than they will in ten to twenty years time. Like, like you were saying, that's just how, like that's just how progress works. It's so even though uh, like you know. There, like, there will be another new thing in, in like in ten to twenty years where craft beer drinkers will be, like will be saying, at, like saying things about how, like how it was now when like when they're just getting first into it in like in the early twenty twenties. So mm. you know it's there's always going to be something. It's like it'll be easier for them now, but in ten to twenty years they'll be thinking like, oh shit, back in twenty twenty two, you guys had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it too is that I mean like we're beer nerds like we're into beer we know a lot about beer and like you know what like what goes into a good brown ale and what makes a brown ale great and like if I I mean for an example if I go to an art museum I see a picture it's like 
that's a pretty good picture of flowers. And the art nerd might be like, are you like, are you insane? Look at the brush strokes. And do you know, like, the, the, like <laughs> sorry. So I don't know. I don't know. No, you're right, man. It's, it's sometimes, I don't know. I don't know about you blokes. I, I imagine we're all probably similar ages, but I finding as I'm getting older, you sort of think about these things. Whereas when you're in your twenties or whatever, you just like, it's not even a thing. And it's like, now it's more, I more think of it from a perspective of what are people missing? Like, what are you missing out by not understanding the history? For example, my girlfriend's cousin works for my company. He's 24. Love him. He is a weird Janet Zeta in the good way because we have another podcast with my brother and him that we talk about rap music and all that type of stuff. So, so part of the podcast, we're like, all right, we're going to give you two albums from the 90s to listen to for next week, which is his idea. So we give him like maybe one R and B album, one hip hop album. Yo, I've seen him play like old Wu Tang stuff from the like nineteen ninety five, and no, he's born in ninety eight when I finished high school, which is hilarious because I could be his father. <laughs> um, he is like I, I see he's I, he uses Apple Music, so he's like playing it, and he knows all the words to Jizz and Liquid Swords and Raekwon only built for Cuban links. I'm like, how the like why does this child to me? know all of these things from the 90s because he's starting to understand the context of the music he, but he loves the stuff now too he loves future and drake and all that stuff but he understands where it came from he knows the architects of the the genre that he's into right and i'm like i've seen him look back at that and understand it and he was like on the podcast, he's like, man, like the new music today has got nothing on the 90s. I'm like, where are the old farts? Like, why are you saying that? <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting for him to say that. And I've always been a, not about paying your dues as much as just understanding the history of something. Like, it's like people into rock music today. If you haven't gone and listened to, I don't know, Zeppelin and Rolling Stones or whatever and understanding where the, where it came from, it's hard to really appreciate something. And that's sort of how I feel about any given topic even play zelda be pissed off and then go play call of duty or whatever like see where it came from i don't know that's just something that i i don't think it's essential but i think it's helpful i don't know for sure off topic i gotta say it's kind of related i a part a little part of me dies every time i hear a 90s song on a classic rock station <laughs> <laughs> Look, yeah. the, 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 there are yeah. the, there are some awkward decades here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I never thought about that. Like those oldies stations, and they start playing the shit we grew up with on that. And you're like, oh, <laughs> are we old? I'm not old. Yeah. You're old. You no, guys are it's old. The children that are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the episode name? It's the children that are wrong. <laughs> uh, no, no more children. But either way, <laughs> the children need more brown ales is really what the conclusion we're coming to. Here. <laughs> Absolutely. And it, uh, it's a fascinating conversation and it's it's cool to kind of revisit something like this and just sort of like, I don't know, fuck around with this conversation, but also like enjoy the beer whilst, I don't know, it's sick. It's something about it that's like, it's really for me, I don't know about either of you, maybe not you Gavin because you have the year round of there so you're drinking this regularly, but Nate, like are you drinking brown ales at, at, at any sort of regularity where it's like not like oh fuck, I'm having a brown ale like this, you know? Very, very, very seldom. Unless like I, unless I'm making a really concerted effort to seek one out, it doesn't uh, like it doesn't come up in my rotation very often. But uh, like, but on a case like this, I'm really, really glad when it does. Yeah, man. The last one I could think of was a Sankey M one. I can't think of another one. That's probably the last one for me too. Which is. Which is great. And it's just more like, I don't know, all of this is kind of coming up because, excuse me, like the appreciation of it, really. Um, yeah. I just, I just think it's cool. And I was I, gonna, I, I, I feel like, I, like, like, Gavin, I feel like you would vibe really well with the guys at, like, at Saint Kim Baron. They, they, like, their approach to styles, I think, would be, they, like, would be very similar to yours. Um, they, they, like, and the way, like, the way they go about, uh, they, like, classic loggers and classic Belgian styles, I, I, like, I feel like you'd really get along with them well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I really, I, I see that too, actually, which is cool, which is something that, you know, Nate's in Ottawa. I was, I was just in Montreal and, and, and out here. So, like, seeing the, the, um, I guess similarities of some of the breweries that maybe just don't know each other. And it's just because we sort of participate in both provinces. Like a lot, of, it's, it's hard in the beer world because you just do what you think. 
um, you know, running your damn business. You don't really have time a lot of a lot of time to sort of be, you know, hey, who can you know what's going on, meeting people and all that type of stuff. Particularly between the provinces, because there's not many things that are sort of industry things that are set up to sort of facilitate that. Like there's the o OCB here, the AMBQ out there, but what's the in between, you know? Yeah, they just make it so hard too to work with people from other provinces. Like if we did go do a collab in Quebec or whatever, it's like sweet, let's get a keg to sell at our brew pub. It's like no, we can't do that. It's... You're right. Yeah. The only way around that is to do the double collab, mm -hmm. like same yeah. beer at both sides, or yeah, slightly different beer at both sides as a tweak on the other thing or whatever, which is, uh, tends to be the way that people get around it these days. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I had a really good point about that. I was just going to mention. Um, Fuck, I forgot. But I, or you yeah. can do, or like, or, or, or you can do like blood, like blood brothers and uh, Les Bass Public did that one time where it's kind of like, is this legal? I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> yeah, just bring the keg and see what happens. I feel like if you bring a keg, by the time anyone finds out about it, the keg is gone. Like, ah, <laughs> yeah, keg. Okay. Yeah, and you usually get a couple of warnings before you get in trouble too. There you so. go. Not that we would encourage any behavior like that because we are no, no, very no, much by the law. We respect the beer laws that are, what, 100 plus years old? Because yeah, very logical, in the, reasonable beer laws. The 19, exactly. The 1920s, the prohibition people, they knew how to make a beer law. God damn it. We're going to follow that. <laughs> I feel like this might be a myth, but I feel like someone told me that in the, the beer laws for like the federal excise, it says somewhere that you have to have a post for the excise officer to hitch their horse to outside your brewery. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I hope that's true. Oh, that may no. be a myth, but I, I, I have heard that before. Oh my God. I hope that's true. <laughs> I would be mind blown if it's not true. I, <laughs> I really feel like that's the point of like, you know, every single thing in society has kind of been, well, okay, that's not true. A lot of things that we're, that we are, how we operate are based off laws from back then alcohol laws being the most obvious example of this is how it goes and then nobody and only took the pandemic for ontario to be like um cool so now there's independent bottle shops and now like restaurants bars coffee shops or whatever can sell their own alcohol and then in quebec it was like oh you're a brewery that you know brews but doesn't package on premise cool you can sell your shit there anyway out of the store because you go to any brewery in quebec for the most part, unless they have like the, they just a tap room, they don't serve food. You couldn't buy the, the, the products there, which was always ridiculous to me. Cause you go to Judas CL in Montreal and then they would like, Oh yeah, cool. You have a bunch of beers, but you gotta go see that depreneur, like go catch them before they close. Cause then you can get our stuff there. Yeah. Like, that's, that's fucking yeah. arbitrary. It's wild. It's the dumbest. Uh, New Brunswick. If, so we had the brewery and you were allowed to have a growler filling station on site. Mm -hmm. uh, one cold room, but for the beer, we had to take a keg from one side of the cold room and okay. then like sell it to AMBL and then purchase it back and then move it to the other side of the cold room to like fill growlers with. Oh, come on. <laughs> Dude, for real? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's wild. <sighs> yeah. We have a bad here, but some of the maritime provinces are even, even more illogical. My That's wild. goodness. And, Fuck, that's so great. And even just the fact that even after the pandemic, so cool ships were illegal in Quebec, I think, until like 2018, 2019, as were growlers. Growlers were illegal. I thought that maybe a lot of common sense would start happening because they you know, had these new things in the last two years. They're like, well, businesses can't operate as normal, but how about we do this and this and this? Well, I was like, all right, we're looking good. But they still didn't let um, Quebec do mailing, mail, uh, you know, shipping like they do here in Ontario. I just like... I get that they already had the depreneur situation where anyone could get stuff, but it's not the same. Like you want to be able to order from across the province and stuff. It's just yeah. obscene. And then even like, do you know what I heard? It's it's legal federally for, for example, an Ontario brewery to sell beer to a consumer in BC and ship it there. But what hasn't been established is the taxing um, yeah. It, it, between, because like no, Ontario has to have tax agreements with every single province, and every province has to repeat that. So that's tens and tens of probably over a hundred different tax agreements. So because they haven't gone that far, just the fact that it's legal isn't enough to yeah. make it happen. 
which and that's only and, and that's only fairly recently even uh like that's Ooh. in the last like three or four years that that federal regulation was dropped but like you say that wasn't really the linchpin on this it's all of the like, it's all of the interprovincial um the, like agreements that are like that are preventing it that from uh the, like from kind of coming full force which is i mean i guess it's complicated and i absolutely understand and but I just feel like alcohol is such an over... They overly complicate the industry once again from 100 years ago. And they just sort of like... Whilst they put a stranglehold on businesses, period, over the last couple of years, um, they make it... I don't know, just things that like... You know what? You know, whatever. Shit happened. Things were rough. Just make it easier for everyone to make a living and to, and to keep employees on and to keep the, do- the lights on, the doors open. Like, I, I don't understand why... I feel like alcohol cops it almost harder than anybody else. I would, I yeah, I mean, say. it's really interesting to see that. I mean, because cannabis is like a really new industry say, here. Yes, like how everywhere. open and accessible that is, because they're like developing it all from scratch, Ooh. and it's not based on like a hundred and fifty year old like grandfathered in legislation about horse hitches and things <laughs> like that. Dude, that's such a good point. I was thinking that as you said it. In Quebec, they're only in the government stores, but in Ontario, obviously, they're everywhere. And it started here in Hamilton, I believe. That was someone told me that this is where the, the the pilot city in Ontario for the cannabis store. That's why there's eight hundred trillion of them here. And you're right, they're they're everywhere. I mean, the the rules are still dumb that you can't have any, you can't see through the windows and whatever, whatever. But there's so much, so much less red tape for something so new compared to alcohol, which is prevalent and very easy to allow businesses to sort of do business um easier and, and simpler and, and stuff and just like i don't know it's 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 funny and i absolutely empathize with any you know with the breweries sort of uh you know yeah situation trying to sort of uh make make things uh operate it's trash but you know what's not trash anderson's ipa that we're about to cross <laughs> yep let's fucking nice do it segment. look at that you like that i did that for you gavin i did that for you mate Look at this. It's a West Coast vibe out here. We got this 6.5% IPA. Glorious, classic Anderson gem right here. What are the uh, the hops in this one, dude? So this one is mostly Idaho 7. It also has uh, Cascade, Centennial, Columbus, and Cashmere. Woo! Uh, Nate and I, our favorite hop is Idaho 7. Oh yeah, I love it. It's like I mean, it's got it a good punch, it has good oil Ooh. content, but it's not. It's not. I mean, it's different enough. It has a lot of more melon, peach notes, and it's not just all citrus like a lot of American hops are. So I love yes, it. Yes, I, I agree, man. It's a uh, a super interesting one, and it's not very common. I still feel like uh, Idaho Seven isn't the most uh, common hop out there. When you do grab it, it's like ooh, that's fire, but it still feels yeah. in between. Nate, yeah, do you know, know what hops? Is it? Yeah, go on, sorry. Is it like a branding issue or something like that? It doesn't sound <laughs> as flashy as other hops, but it, like, it's, a, it's a solid hop. Idaho is not a cool state. <laughs> you know what's, what, what hops in this? People think of potatoes or something. Yeah. Hey, I love potatoes. Who doesn't like fries? <laughs> Nate, do you know what hops in this? The number one hop? Uh, is it Idaho 7? Yeah, fucking damn right it is, buddy. Absolutely. There we go. I was just telling Gavin, it's our fave. This smells uh, glorious. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, as soon as you've poured that, I'm going to put this in my face all night. So I, like, so I want to tell a story, um, <laughs> if I may, about my first taste of this when, uh, when I first it. visited the brewery back in 2017. Can we sip in the meantime? Woof. Oh, Cheers. my goodness. Cheers, boys. Mm. Cheers. Oh, that is gorgeous. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, yeah man. The aroma on this is just spectacular. Yeah. So, th- it, like, so this beer, when I first tasted it uh, back in 2017, was the first beer that, like, like wh- where I experienced um, dank in a beer uh, like, <laughs> in, in an IPA. It was uh, like I, I never quite really. Like had ever experienced that before, and uh, like when I first tried this, and like the first take a whiff of it, I'm like, God 
damn, that smells like weed. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, I, and I had never, like, it really took me by surprise because I had never, um, like, because I had never experienced that before. And, and like, and kind of mm. tastes like weed smells, if that makes any sense. Um, sure like, that's does. what I always, that's what I always associate dank with. And uh, like, that, that's just really stuck with me ever since. Um, and uh, like, and yeah, like this is just a fantastic West coast, which like just has a really, really nice punch of dank to it. And that's what I've always loved about this. Yeah. I think that's what like the new Englands are missing. It's like West coast IPAs. You got your citrus or like your melon, peach fruit, whatever, but you've also got like some pine and you've got some dankness and you've got some bitterness like that. That brings the whole package together. Dude, this is delicious. Nate, we should add this one to our West coast IPA episode. Yeah, and we both got it, so we can absolutely do yeah. that. Let's do it. We're doing an episode soon, uh, just Nate and I talking about West Coast IPAs because we just feel like they're just not getting their uh, the props, and um, yeah. we're just collating the beers for it right now. So we got just got a couple from Quebec, and now we're like racking up some Ontario ones, and I'm just drinking this, and I'm losing my shit, and I'm like, this is what we need. <laughs> Honestly, dude, this is spectacular. I'm not even it exaggerating. Really is. This is glorious. I absolutely. St- I feel like this has got to be one of the most underrated West Coast IPAs in Ontario. I feel like people should be talking about this. This is like money in every, like it's the most, it's balanced, it's smooth, it's it's just sweet enough. Like Nate said, it's dank. I don't think it tastes like drinking weed because I think it's more approachable than that. Maybe when you first have one, I can see that being probably like, whoa, like what is this? Um <laughs> This is fantastic, bro. Uh, yeah. Is oh, this, has this changed since 2016 or is it basically the same thing? Uh, I would say, yeah, if there's any changes, it was just like, I don't know, like a telephone game of recipe sheets where people have like written down <laughs> wrong numbers over six years. But no, as far as I know, it's, it's essentially unchanged. Like year over year, we get different crops of hops and we, we pick the lot that we think best matches what we're trying to, trying to do. But uh, it should be the same. Yeah. We haven't really touched this one in six years because we like it and people still like it. Amazing. I think it's uh, between this and the cream ale. I think every LCBO in London, uh, they're the top two like best-selling craft beers. So really, but that's uh, amazing. Know, maybe we need to like hire a marketing agency or something like that because no one else has heard of it. <laughs> uh, uh, this is this is criminal. Um, this is like. And I say this, I mean, I guess, like I said, uh, West Coast IPA seem to be relative, like I say, easy to, not easy to get is not really the word, maybe year round or accessible as far as like, you know, it's not just a small batch that, that a brewery has released and they do it once off or whatever. I feel like there isn't yeah. as many out here. I, I, in no. Quebec, there isn't a shit ton either, to be fair, but this is, this is like... This aside from aside from, aside from like a small West Coast IPAs, uh, there's there's more of a novelty at this point. I think. Yeah. I think that's yeah. changing. That's why we want to do the episode. Outside of like a small handful, like you, like you know, because you because you've got like your Nickelbrook Headstock, your like your Sawdust Lone Pine, yeah, your Muskoka shaker. Mad Tom, like like the, like yeah, your Bone Shaker. That yeah, that's a, that, that's it's another great intense. example. Yeah. But like, like those are like, like those are kind of the. The, like like the ones that you can find even in like even in your small rural LCBOs that like like you'll be able to find like you'll be able to find those there. But outside of kind of those four, um, like year round, there's not like, like there's not very many no. that you like, like that you can find just about anywhere. Like and I mean I'm that like, like I was super happy when I started to see this bad boy popping up in uh, like in Ottawa LCBOs. And I'm like, yes, please. I'll grab a six pack of that. <laughs> I'm even thinking now I will look out for it. Uh, I imagine it gets out here in Hamilton too. Uh, too a little bit. Yeah. We're, we're starting to move out a bit. I mean, we had like Good. during COVID, we just kind of locked down and didn't really do much, but now that we're opening up again, we're starting to ship some beer out, but yeah, it's funny. I'll, anytime you see any beer in Ottawa for the last couple of years, it was just a like a buddy I worked with like as a summer student for four or five years. He moved to Ottawa. And he was like, "Man, I love your beer. Like, can I just can I be like a part time salesman? You just like pay me beer or whatever." And it's like, "Okay, that's fine." So he like he didn't really kind of worked for us, but he would also just like go to LCBOs and be like, "You got like 
here's a card. You got to buy this beer. And someone would take it. So we what never was his had name? Like a, uh, his name was Scott. I, you know what? I met Scott, but uh, the, the, like, uh, I, I think, um, that this would have been a couple of, this would have been a couple of years before COVID, but I think like, I think he, like he hooked me up with some stuff and I like, and I did some uh, like a bit for the blog. I remember meeting him a, a little while back. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's just a, a buddy I worked with for like, I don't know, four or five years and he's got a government job in Ottawa. So he's just like doing it cause he just cause he likes to. So <laughs> that's awesome. Legend. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I think that's super dope. And I feel like there's like, there's like, there seems to be like a bit of a resurgence of interest in West Coast IPAs, and I think it's because of the over prevalence of New England IPAs, whether they're great or not so great, and people want a bit of a taste of something, you know, reminiscent of of, of what they came up with. Hence, in the same way that lagers have sort of had a resurgence in popularity in that kind of crowd. If you go to a, you know, a, a, a trendy brewery they're going to do lagers ipas imperial pastry stouts and smoothies essentially and lagers crept into that and i think west coast are like yeah just you know subtly getting into that world and i think there's a new interest in them but there's not like we were all saying like we're struggling to think of the year rounders um and i guess the one-offs you know there's some good stuff, of course, as well. But I mean, you know, you want the you want to be able to access a West Coast IPA year round, as opposed to waiting for some brewery to just sort of do a a one time um, beer. And, you know, we mentioned a few here in, in Ontario, there's, but like, what's that for? Yeah, like, that's kind of crazy, though. And there isn't even that many more in Quebec. I think it's probably pretty similar if we think about the year rounders, um, which is a shame. Because they're just such like I feel like I've a, I feel like it's almost because of the volume of New England IPAs that that flavor profile has become more interesting and more nuanced. Because I'm like, you're not like back in the day, this would have been needed to be in a hundred IBU pallet wrecker. Remember that be a pallet yeah. wrecker from Green Flash, like yeah. strip my tongue of all the the fucking taste buds. Let's go. Like that's not what they've become. They they they've become this more balanced. Thing that still has all those dank elements that Nate you were talking about. They're still very piney, very resinous, bitter, but they're also tropical and a little bit sweet and yeah. stone fruit and peach and maybe some mango and stuff. It's like they're a different beast perhaps than what they were back then. Maybe not crazy different, but they're this different, like, this different kind of approach to an IPA that is that seems to be valued by a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah, I think. I mean, what you talk about the bitterness, I think, is is spot on. Like, you don't really want a palate wrecker, but like, I had the uh, the privilege of uh, speaking with the head brewer of Pilsner Kell this summer, and and uh, he was saying what he thinks is the the perfect amount of bitterness is where you take a beer, you get some malty sweetness, you get some hop character, you get some balance. And then about 10 seconds later, the bitterness starts to dry out your tongue. And then you automatically like go for another sip to kind of balance that out. So I think that's what West Coast IPs have that the New England ones don't, is they don't have that yeah. bitterness that, that like brings it back. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. Mm-hmm. And, it's, and, and maybe that's why they're becoming popular again, because people were like, okay, well, you know, I can chase new haze all I like, but what about you know something different give me something a little little let me switch it up a bit and it sort of it seems to have come into that world i guess is what i'm kind of saying with that and and there's a there's a that coupled with the appreciation for something like a well crafted lager i think is sort of brought back i don't know i feel like for me and i imagine you guys are sort of like maybe gavin it sounds like you've always been kind of on this stuff but i feel like i went off a lot of things and i've really been around the kind of you know, craft be a kind of wheel or whatever you want to call it and then kind of come back to the beginning where now I appreciate everything basically mm-hmm. for the most part I went off barley wines for a while and now I really appreciate barley wines again I get it they're not this like messy caramel thing they're just my friend was yeah like, no no Noah and I fi- Noah and I finally broke you and got and like and got you back on the train <laughs> you guys did and I love it they're like you know what why do you love an imperial style I'm like because oh, it's creamy chocolatey like bitter coffee I'm like yeah cool so a barley wine's that, but just like caramel and nutty. I'm like, ah, oh, all right. And now I re-love barley wines again. 
and I feel like there's this like resurgence of love or appreciation for these different um, styles that maybe might have been ignored for a while because I was chasing something that I couldn't get because there was a while from between 2016 and 2018 maybe where like it was wasn't the easiest to get a, a shit ton of haze in Canada that was quality like you had to go to the states to get a lot of it which is what I was really after not many breweries were doing it consistently and really trying to sort of you know put stuff out so I feel like after because it was hard to get it made it more exciting to find it to or to to try and chase it and then now it's kind of come back to like all right well it's pretty prevalent now everywhere does it pretty well but what else does your palate want and then you want to like switch it back up and when you go kind of back to the beginning oh yeah i, I mean the strategy I feel like the more intense and stronger beer is like the easier it is to get burnt out on one it's just like the it's like the classic like sitcom dads like if you see your son smoking a cigarette it's like you smoke the whole pack and they're like i never want to smoke again <laughs> like if you have like a hundred juicy ips in a row at some point you're like i never want a juicy ip again i want something different now yep yep yeah and, and that's sort of where it's at. And I feel like West Coast are really, um, I feel like also something cool about it. It's like, it's a slow grind. It's not like West Coast are popping. Everyone's chasing West Coast. It's like, it's like, yeah, real slow. Like I did a trade with a dude in Montreal the other day. He wanted some stuff from here and he had some stuff he got from the States. He's like, oh, are you into West Coast? Do you mind if I get, I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking into West Coast. Send me this shit. And like, but he had to ask me. Yeah. And I just thought that was interesting that out of all the beers he sent me, it was one West Coast. And it was fantastic. From all this California beer, it was fantastic. I was very happy to get it. But it's still in that stage where you're like, oh, are you, are you cool with that? I'm like, no, bro, just give me that haze. Like, maybe that's what he expected <laughs> to hear. And I gave him, yeah. I got him barley wines, like double barrel aged barley wines. Yeah. But he was trying to well, be I mean, it'll be interesting to see if like if uh, West Coast IPAs are making a resurgence, or if in five years I'll just be back on the podcast and we can substitute the whole Brown segment for the West Coast IPA segment. And- <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're well, doing. I just don't like them well, anymore. It's a great <laughs> style. <laughs> well, Gavin, I was tell uh, like, like I was telling uh, C just uh, like just a few days ago because we were talking about this uh, like, like this West Coast episode that we're like that we're gonna do uh, like, like fairly soon, and I was saying that like. West Coast IPAs are the ones that I keep in my fridge when I want like a no pressure beer, like one that I'm not taking photos of, one that I'm not doing content for. And like, like if I just want a beer just to enjoy, like that's one where I'll just like that I'll just pull out a West Coast for. Like, like West Coasts are the ones that I'll be buying a four pack of instead of like instead of just a single of. Like that's mm, what I want na- like nowadays. Even more, like even more than haze. That's what I like. That's what I'm going for now. Yeah, man, I get it. I feel like it's like, like you said, it's like um, it's the it, comfort beer now. Yeah, I like that. The comfort beer. Like I feel very like this is spectacular. I'm not. I don't know if I, I really don't want to sound like I'm overselling this. This is fucking amazing. No, this you're not. Like, you're not. Like I'm. I'm so but, deeply <laughs> impressed, Gavin. This shit is like. I mean, all of this stuff is fantastic, and like. No, I was saying earlier, I was very much looking forward to this convo because I've been a fan of what you do for since Nate put me onto you guys, and this is so dope. But I really feel like that if people get, particularly the people who may be more excited about the trendy stuff, they get to try something like this, and they hear they they can taste the nuance here. Jesus Christ, on my lip, um, like the nuance of these beers, they're just so interesting and they're so different to what you're used to. But you know, it's what the three of us came up drinking, but. If you're newer to it, 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 it'll be a palate explosion for you because it's all of these different, it's the same hops. You mentioned all the same hops, like Idaho 7, you said Cashmere. Um, what else was it? I'm sorry. There was like a uh, bunch. Cascade Centennial Columbus. Yeah, okay, all, so those all the, are the, the classic C hops, cool. But Cashmere and, uh, and Idaho 7 are typically used pretty regularly in, uh, in Haze. And it's those same hops used in this beer. So you're going to get a lot of the same flavor profiles, like we were saying, like mango and, and peach and stone fruit, but in a different way. And the expression is different, but it's the same product. I feel like that is worth, isn't that what we're all after? We're all after new flavors, new approaches. So I, I like there's something yeah. to that. And I think that's why they're becoming more popularized. And Nate, you made a good point the other day when you were telling me that. I thought that was really cool. And I feel like... I still feel like I was. I find it difficult to get my hands on West Coast IPAs regularly. 
Yeah. And whenever I have them, it's always a, a glorious uh, pleasure to have them. It's just, it's not, they're not just like slapped in front of your face. And like we were saying as well, this one seems to be on the underrated side of things and it absolutely should be in there in the conversation for the best West Coast in the province. Absolutely. And this one's available year round. Year, year round. round yeah. You got the LCBO app. You just search Anderson, mate. You get that IPA. You fucking get down to that uh, bloody LCBO and you, you grab yourself a, not one. You get three six packs of that. <laughs> or, if, uh, like, or fucking order it. Get it sent right to your door. All oh, that. Yeah. Anywhere in Ontario. There you go. Anywhere. I mean, if you were, if you were saying you can get uh, Gen Z to appreciate uh, <laughs> Wu-Tang Clang and, and Led Zeppelin, then maybe there's a hope for West Coast IPAs. <laughs> you never know. You never know. <laughs> I oh, have faith. See, did, we, did we lose your video there? Yeah, yeah. It's just the battery died in the camera. Oh, she's, okay, okay. She's coming back in just a moment. Um, you can hear me there, right? Yeah, yeah. We can still hear you. Yeah, it's uh, just kicking back in. That's really what it is. Um, and with that, was there anything else we wanted to touch on this evening? Or we feel like we have captured the essence of Anderson? What, like that? I think that's pretty much it i mean yeah <laughs> there's not a, not a whole lot left to it we just we tried all the beers i like so well we have more that i like but we only have so much time and that's true um no man we'll have to we'll, we'll have to check back in with you again sometime or we'll uh we'll, we'll get to some more that you like <laughs> yeah man sounds good to me i'd love to this was this was a ton of fun i don't know how long this is going to take to get this in so what i'm going to do in, oh look at that what is that you're back. back there you go there we go I'm going to have to remove the other one, though, because, uh, oh, I can't remove it while it's doing that. I just want to get the uh, thumbnail. Oh, I could probably do it this way. No, that's kind of weird, isn't it? When I got that other one. But, no, this has been dope, man. Um, I've really enjoyed, like, sort of walking through the lineup and, and just sort of, like, seeing exactly what you guys have been doing and hearing the story. And uh, I am as impressed as I thought I would be. It was fantastic. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's been a blast. Genuine pleasure. Um, let me, if I go like this, so here we go. And I can go like that, and then like that. There we go. That'll do it. There so we are. Thing O kicks back in. Um, let me take the. Let's take the thumbnail. Let's get the yep. old uh, screenshot here. We'll go that way. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. Hold up some beers. Beautiful. Oh, gotta get that brown ale in there. Oh, yeah, I got this. Gonna get the strayer. All right, y'all ready? Yep, let's do it. <laughs> oh, that is glorious. Um, Gavin, where can everybody find Anderson? Ooh, excuse me, online, bro. Oh yeah, select LCBOs or our website. I mean, craftdales.com.ca. Probably both work. Like we got an online store. We ship anywhere in Ontario. So, or just come to the brewery. Is the best case. I'll probably be there. Give him, give him a hug. Ask Gavin for a hug. He'll give you a hug. <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. And uh, what's the what's the social? Is it Anderson Craftdales or is it Anderson? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't have any social media, but I'm pretty sure it's Anderson Craftdales. Twitter's Anderson C Ales, but I think Twitter's kind of a dumpster fire right now. Anyways, <sighs> I don't want to talk about it. Elon is <laughs> pissing me off right now. <laughs> it's Anderson Craftdales on Instagram, but yes, Elon yeah, is dropping yeah, yeah, very often. Uh, Nathaniel, where can everyone find you online, my guy? Uh, everywhere. It's at Nathan Does Beer, and you can like, and you can find me occasionally here co-hosting BAOS podcast. Love to see it, um, guys. Stick around uh, once we wrap up. We'll say goodbye off air. But uh, Gavin, thank you so much for your time, man. This is a, a pleasure and an honor to chat with you, bro. Like once again, we've both been big fans for for a long time. So really cool to get the story, to hang out, shoot the shit. This is uh, this is a lot of fun. Really, sure, yeah. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah, like, man. Thanks so much for being here. Like Nate said, let's do it. Let's do it again. We'll keep in touch, and we'll, we'll do it again next year. It'd be great. To, uh, you know, keep in touch. See what's going on. Drink some brown ale. You know the vibes. Um, <laughs> everybody, thank you so much for watching and listening. If you enjoyed the episode, smash the thumbs up, hit subscribe below, hit the notification bell. Nathaniel, ding. So you know when the new new drops. Follow us everywhere at BAOS Podcast. Check out the long form audio. We drop every Wednesday, eight p.m. Eastern. Now it is pitch black at five p.m. You know the vibes. Um, we will see you guys in the next episode. Cheers. Cheers.